For those of you who think gospel music has gone too far, you were right. So thank y'all for not leaving. Okay, the reason we're all gathered here today is because um, a few days ago, I watched this interview between Kirk Franklin and Amanda Seals on her podcast, which I didn't even know she had a podcast. I don't typically follow her or um, channels like that. But um, there was just a lot of interesting things that Kirk Franklin said and statements that she made that I just thought would be really good for conversation, teachable moments. What did Kirk Franklin get right? What did he get wrong? Um, some of y'all probably already saw the video that I posted over the weekend where it seemed like he was kind of flirting with her a little bit. So um, I'm going to replay Pretty much, we'll see how far we get in the time frame. I'm not going to stay up all night with y'all, but I don't know. We might we might hang out for a little bit. But I just wanted to go through this and just give my commentary, maybe go through a few scriptures that I think are helpful. Um, and I do think this is a, a, a significant conversation because if y'all are talking to your friends and loved ones, coworkers and all that, you know, some of them are Christians, some of them are not. And sometimes you have to be prepared to have a defense for your faith, even when um, it's just a casual conversation, because we are supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be sharing our faith with people. And sometimes people have ideas that just don't, they don't align with reality. They don't align with Christianity. Sometimes they don't even align with their own statements. You know, people believe contradictory things. So I just kind of wanted to talk about some of that stuff. So again, I am so sorry that it took so long for us to get started, but by God's grace, we are here. Amen and amen. Um, Y'all, before we before I hit this video, I want to see 34 likes because there's 34 people watching me right now. Um, if you're on YouTube, please go ahead and give this video a like. Amen and amen. Also, the channel is now accepting memberships. I did a poll, um, I think it was yesterday, maybe it was the day before yesterday, and y'all said, Y'all want to see um, members only live streams. Y'all want to see members only videos. And some of y'all was just like, we don't care if you don't do anything than what you've already been doing. We just want to support you. So if y'all believe in the Miss Titus channel, Miss Titus Jones, formerly Miss Titus 2, please hit the membership button, subscribe. I'm going to be posting and interacting with you guys through different forms of content in the future, but I need your help to do that. So please subscribe to the channel and please join memberships. Okay. All right. So let's get to the fun stuff, the, the nitty gritty. Oh, where do I want to start? And uh, I guess I'll start off by saying thank you and welcome everyone in the live chat. Kirk Franklin, dude. <laughs> I don't know who is behind this channel name, but this is hilarious. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome, Brother Reggie. Welcome, Devos. Um, who else is here? PJ, the BCV book. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Okay, let's let's get it started. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, is it this one? This one? That's a little bit too small, don't you think? I think so. That's a little bit better, isn't it? Okay, we started from the beginning, and I got it playing on, I'll do 1.5 1, 1. speed starting off, just because I want y'all to at least be able to hear some of what's going on. Sound good? Let me make sure y'all can even hear that, because the way my life has been set up lately, let's just make sure everything is fine this time. <clears throat> also share tab audio, yes, okay. Let's go. <laughs> Small doses. We've been here for five years, 270 some odd episodes, but we have never discussed. Discussed. <laughs> discussed. <laughs> We've never discussed like anything in the realm, even like juxtaposed or, you know, up against uh, religion. I'm shocked. We, you, <laughs> I'm not shocked. I'm just being You're being facetious? Yeah, because I mean, the thing is, is that <laughs> it's very difficult to have that conversation with unless you have a clear direction because you can get misconstrued you know it can it can go uh into a direction that is i don't think healthy um and it becomes just like people being egotistical about like well i know this and you know this and i know this etc cetera, etc cetera. Unfortunate. it's unfortunate so i've been very particular about when i wanted to have a conversation that went into the realm of spirituality and uh thus landing at faith cancers um so we are here with the legendary iconic it's too much. It's too much. You think so? I think it's a little pushed. Why do you think it's a little pushed? I think you're pushing a little bit, but it's okay. Let's get into this good stuff. Yeah, it's a little pushed. 
Yeah, it's okay. Y'all know I don't lie. So we're here with the legendary and iconic Kirk Franklin. I'm very happy to have you here. You don't lie at all. I was chastised on my way here, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> because as a black man, I was late. <laughs> <laughs> Why gotta be as a black man? <laughs> and, no, can we also- me, And she gave it to me. Listen, let me tell you something. I have been in uh, this, this field for over 30 years. I want you to know that today was the first time in 30 years that I've ever had in my entire career. Really? In fact, a fellow creative- like, Correct you. No, 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 not correct me. <laughs> Take their belt off. Take their belt it's off. It's just because I have bass and, in my voice. And, 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 and basically, Denzel me in glory. Yeah. That yeah. is yeah. wildly yeah. Yeah, that's offensive. What happened. Yeah, that's what happened. I did not Denzel you in glory. That's what you did. You Let me tell glory. you what I did. But, but, but I'm happy to be here, scars and all. Let me tell you. <laughs> I asked this brother, okay? I said, I know you serving on time, Pat. <laughs> but are you an on time man? Because, and I, because... and I lied and said, yes, I was. When I, <laughs> when I knew I was, but I was trying to impress her. She's a man. She's Amanda. She's Amanda Skill. I was trying to impress her. Thank you. And I appreciate you. But the most impressive thing is honesty. Because what it Ooh, meant facts, facts, was that I was facts. scheduling things I'm based on right. you and your... If you had said to me, I am not really an on-time person, I would have scheduled things differently. And I knew that today was a very jam-packed day. I but failed. I knew that we only had a small window of your time. I failed. I failed. No, you did not fail. But I want to let you know the context because okay. you all, what you also heard was disappointment because we, me, Jeremiah, like the Bible, that's literally <laughs> his name, uh, but, but, we were but, excited but, to have this combo. And at the same time, I also have to admit to you, even as a man, even, 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 even as a happily married man, it was very powerful and very sexy. I don't want to hear that. Okay, it was. Okay. It was very powerful <laughs> and very sexy. I don't want to hear it. Uh, and also, okay. because, I mean... It, it was very powerful. Yeah. Very, very, very it, it would be, it would be very lovely. Attractive. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop right there. I know I let that play for quite a while. So that was the, that was the topic of the video that I released this weekend. Um, overall, I just felt like that was crossing the line because I, I know that Kirk said I'm a happily married man, but I do believe that those statements were inappropriate. And I think Amanda Seals was immediately like, don't talk to me like that. That's that's crossing the line. Y'all let me know in the live chat how you feel about it. But we'll continue because there's a, we got a lot of ground to cover. OK. All right. It would it's be very lovely when a if, woman if just, that would be lovely if men felt that way, but it, it was, it, not. They it was only powerful. feel that way when they're not your men. No, well, no, 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 no. That's how I'm as a man, period. But we need to get into my God and Jesus and Bible and all that other stuff. So come on. <laughs> so the idea, the concept of faith. So this came out of, we were trying to figure out like, okay, what do we want to discuss that really encapsulates just not only your belief system, but also the work that you have created that has given so many people a, like a direct path to like preserving their faith, to being able to stand on their faith, et cetera. Hi, Mark Barton at Sandy Hook Promise here. When the gunman... You know, I often say, when I find myself in murky waters, I'm like, dang, it would be so great to be a Christian right now. Oh! Because I, I could really use some faith. <laughs> which is, which is, I think, uh, the, the area that becomes problematic of faith is that the reason why it doesn't have a very, uh, a very substantive space in, just in the context of modern culture is because historically it has always been more of a spare tire. Elaborate what you say. Oh, just something that you pull out when you yes, need it. Yes, yes, yes. I think because mm. it has never become much of the fabric of, of, of our DNA is because uh, it has become easier to argue God away because we don't really have all the full information of the idea of God or the facts of God or the understanding of the historical context that people subscribe to Christianity through. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say, though, that the concept of God is not, I mean, it's not even fair to say, it's just facts. The concept of God is not simply, is not quote unquote owned by Christianity. No, it's right? not. No, it's not. And no, so when no. we talk about faith, we can actually talk about faith beyond the confines of Christianity. Because yes. ultimately, yes. faith in a higher power yes. is not necessarily relegated to like how religion shows up in that aspect. But All right, y'all let me know in the comments and those watching this later on, how would you respond if someone that you know and love said something like that? Well, I think she said Christianity is not, or excuse me, the idea of God or the concept of God is not purely a Christian thing. And she is right about that. But... This is where we can ask follow-up questions. Now, I'm sure some of y'all know uh, Greg Coco. He has this book called Tactics, and it, it kind of helps you um, learn how to have conversations with people that helps you to kind of stay in control of the conversation, but navigate them toward seeing um, what's wrong with the statements that they make. So in this case, I would ask her, okay, so Christianity may not be the only religion that believes in a higher power, but why should I believe if, if I shouldn't be a Christian, why should I believe that these other gods exist? How do you know for sure that these gods are real, that they exist, that they're worth following? Um, you know, follow up questions. So it's not just that I'm right and you're wrong, but ask people questions. Um, but OK, let's keep going. Let's keep going. But it's not always quantifiable. 
with, with the, with the, without things that are more substantive, things that are more That's fundamental. Fair. And I think that there is an academic intellectual perspective to the idea of Christianity that 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 often is misunderstood or <clears throat> misused. misused or it gets lost in revisionist history. So, you know, for me, so when we met, um, you know, I forgot Which what- was amazing. We did meet at Celebrity Squares. It was a good time. It was amazing. And- uh, I'm very- I'm so sorry, y'all. I forgot that I had stopped sharing my screen. Let me try this again. I'll back up. I'm just sitting here watching. I'm like, y'all can't hear <laughs> I'm all over the place tonight. Okay, we're going to get it together. We're there. Where's the man there, Kurt? Hey, there. Okay, go back. I will go back. Uh, it has become easier to argue God away because we don't really have all the full information of the idea of God or the facts of God or the understanding of the historical context that people subscribe to Christianity through. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say, though, that the concept of God is not, I mean, it's not even fair to say, it's just facts. The concept of God is not simply, it's not quote unquote owned by Christianity. No, it's right? not. No, it's not. And no, so when no. we talk about faith, we can actually talk about faith beyond the confines of Christianity because yes. ultimately yes. faith in a higher power yes. is not necessarily relegated to like how religion shows up in that aspect. But it's not always quantifiable. With, with, with them without things that are more substantive, things that are more That's fundamental. Fair. And I think that there is an academic intellectual perspective to the idea of Christianity that 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 that, that often is misunderstood or <clears throat> misused. misused or it gets lost in revisionist history. So, you know, for me, so when we met, um, you know, I forgot Which what- was amazing. We did meet at Celebrity Squares. It was a good time. It was amazing. And- I, uh, I'm very impressed with this young lady. <laughs> I appreciate being called young lady at 42. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm older than you, so I can- I mean, I won't lie to you. I look, anybody who's listening, you should watch the podcast because I currently look a solid- 56? No, she don't. This look I'm giving today feels very, she's a young 56. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. She says Kirk Franklin is a horrible example of an apologist. Well, he has not even um, really gotten started in his apologetics commentary. It's quite interesting, but um, yeah, let's just let Kirk keep talking. But the dress was definitely giving uh, Preacher's Daughter. That was the vibe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the vibe. Okay. I had I put on something else. And I was like, oh, no, you can't wear that. They're going to be like, who do you think you were interviewing? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Let me get respectful. Uh, I probably am starting too much shin. But. <gasps> shin. I love shin. <laughs> shin. shin. Um, she's a shill in a shin. <laughs> so I, I was saying to you, though, that. I, so I forget. And I respect her for that. Okay. Amanda was like, I, I know I'm interviewing Kirk Franklin. So let me wear something a little bit modest. And this, this is her not even being a Christian. I'm like, okay, all right, okay. Oh, Marcia, welcome. And I hope you are being safe wherever you drive. Thank you for listening, sis. All right. I forget what the question was, but somehow it came up for me saying like, well, you know, I don't consider my, I'm not a Christian, but I do consider myself spiritual. But I think that- um, And you can see the lights go off in the community. Yes, yes. 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 And so then it became, oh, let's discuss. Yes, yes, yes. It's because that is very much by nature who I am. I'm very inquisitive. I'm very much uh, the type of person that wants to get into the details of people's ideals and how they are wired to believe what they believe. And what do you, where do you think that came from? <clears throat> it's because I'm very inquisitive even about my own faith. I'm very much a doubter. And okay. so that's why I subscribe to my faith because in the arguments, I have found enough evidence to believe because I wanted to find a lot of reasons early on to not believe. It's that uh, my faith began to be questioned is because again, being African-American, it's already assumed that we just, <clears throat> we matriculate to faith because of our culture, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in my era, there, 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 there was an era that you were Christian because you went to church, that, that the church and your faith were, were um, 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 they were sometimes synonymous, right? Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that in itself becomes problematic. <clears throat> Why? Well, it's because just because you go to church doesn't, doesn't, yeah, mean, you yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah. mean you're actually yeah, yeah, yeah. subscribing because, to that. Just because you're in the garage to make your car. Fair. We see that all the time. Like okay, that was true now. Because a lot of people be going to church and think that because they go to church, they're a Christian. So I appreciate Kirk Franklin for, for making that distinction. A lot of people go to church and are not Christians. Don't care about Christianity. Don't read the Bible. Don't care what's in the Bible. Don't want to know God. And if that's you, I'm not trying to say that you're a bad person. I'm just saying <laughs> that just going to church alone does not make you a Christian. Being baptized don't make you a Christian. Doing good things doesn't make you a Christian. Calling yourself a Christian in itself doesn't necessarily mean you're a Christian. All right. Okay. <clears throat> There's Thomas be a church, baby. And that's the devil. <laughs> when she looked in the camera, she looked right in the camera. It's so good. Yeah. All the little nuances yeah. that you do is so good. I appreciate anyway, that. let me get back because I'm a fan. But I do think <clears throat> that 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 in itself has become problematic for people of color, especially people of color, being able to intellectually argue the reasons why they believe what they believe. So everything stays on an emotional state. Yes. And and, and so nothing, nothing becomes rooted in any type of space that you can intelligently argue the reasons of why. Also, a great point, okay? A lot of us, and I used to be in this camp, I'm not saying I'm the greatest apologist, but I do love reading apologetics material. I was a Christian um, and I do believe I was saved. I, I truly believe that the Lord saved me at a very young age. 
But at that point, my faith was just that. It was just faith that was not built on evidence. But the Bible talks about faith that is built on evidence. You should believe this because X, Y, Z. Even Paul said, if Christianity is not true, you should not be a Christian. Like we are the, the <laughs> like the people who should be, um, you should feel sorry for us because if you're a Christian and, and Christ is not raised, you're still in your sins. But thank God, we don't have a faith that can't be defended. We have a faith that can be defended. So I appreciate, again, Kirk, for saying that, uh, sadly, and I know this this is not just the Black church. There's plenty of people throughout all different types of church communities who are just, um, some of them are nominal Christians, meaning they're Christian in name only. And some people are Christians because they really have maybe had an experience with God and they really are trying to follow God. But if you were to ask them, like, what's the difference between Christianity and the worldview or, um, you know, what the essentials of the faith are, something like that, they couldn't tell you. And so we, we have to like, it's time for us to, we got to get out of that because the world is getting crazy. And if the church can't defend truth, reality, the truth of the resurrection and, and the scriptures, then we're just going to keep going in a, in a really, really bad direction. So I just encourage pastors, laymen, whatever we can do to disciple the people in our churches so that we are not the ones that Kirk is talking about. We got to do that. Um, James Booker, this is a good, a good thing. He says, I would ask her what she means by spiritual. A lot of people say this, right? Well, I'm not a Christian but I'm spiritual. What does that mean? She's going to explain exactly what she means coming up here. All right, let's get back to it. But you know what I feel like, honestly, Kirk, a lot of times the arguing of why people believe what they believe in terms of their faith oftentimes feels like it's couched in they're, they're using their faith to oppress someone else. Whenever I'm seeing often a lot of, often that's what often I'm seeing in terms be. of the dynamic. Like, cause I feel like, listen, whatever you need to get through, do that for you. Like, I'm not somebody, like, even though I am not a Christian, I am not somebody who feels like it's my business to try to undermine, like, oh, well, let me tell you what the real Bible is. And let me tell you, you know, which I, I see that happen as well, where I'm just like, what are you trying to prove right now? Like, this person may have needed this construct. They may have needed this space. They may have needed this faith um, to simply just get through this life. Like, who are you to come now and try to undermine it because you read some books? Like, that's not, <laughs> that's not, that actually isn't intellectualism. It's actually just egoism. Y'all know how crazy that sounds? She basically said... <laughs> Um, you shouldn't try to defend Christianity on the basis of truth um, because that's anti-intellectualism. That's like saying, you know, if, if I say that two plus two is four and you say that two plus two is five, we should just both throw our hands up in the air and say it doesn't matter what two plus two actually is. You know, just because your math book says two plus two is four and my um, cheat sheet says two plus two is five, who's to say which math is right? You've got your math and I've got my math. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly what she just insinuated, that Christianity should not be argued as if it's true. But the gospel is true. All right. Um, yeah. What is it? Sexy Diva says, or Sexy Diva. <laughs> sexy Disco says, my mama always says, the Bible is a mirror and will read you from head to toe. There are a lot of serial churchgoers and fellowshippers who haven't touched the Bible in a good while. That's that's so true. I got to change my camera so y'all can see my face. Okay. All right. I'm going back to Kirk. Kirk and Amanda. Yes, 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 it can be. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that what separates uh, the conversation that we're having all has to do with motive and intent. Motive and intent, yes. Motive and intent must always be necessary when, when it comes to, for example, like I asked you downstairs, if, because I felt bad for coming late, if I could take you to dinner. Now, I wanted to, if, if my motive and intent was really because I am a fan, mm -hmm. I think that you are brilliant and smart, which is always intriguing for me because I want to ask a billion questions. Thank but you. but in my motive and intent, well, girl, let me take you to, uh, go, let me take you down here to this Waffle House and, and go and get you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, you uh, did uh, say Roscoe's. It's not much better than Waffle House. Well, because it's supposed to be a joke <laughs> and it didn't land well. But you are not a comedian. <laughs> well, you could, well, you know, you could have laughed and then pulled me to the side and say, next time. I don't know if it's a joke. You have to understand something about me. I take everything literal. I know you do. I know you do. And I can see that. It is and it's scary at times. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. But getting back, getting, getting back. Touché. I think that you said touche. Yeah. I think the motive and intent. Now y'all probably already know why I'm giving this face because again, I would, I would put that in the flirtation bucket. Okay. And I think that's not good for anybody. And you know what? I got a, a verse for that. Let me see where I can, where did I put that, that verse? Okay. Because even if this is innocent, it doesn't feel innocent. And she already told him, I'm like, stop flirting with me. Sorry. I got a little call. I had, I 
had a little bug a few weeks ago. And so the cough is lingering a little bit, but um, let me see if I can find this, this uh, scripture that I had. I want to say it was in Proverbs. I want to say it was Proverbs. Yeah, there it goes. Who's that wonderful girl? Okay. Um, Proverbs chapter six. Let's get rid of Amanda and Kirk this time. Stop them. And let's share the other screen. See, let's share that. Hmm, okay. I don't know if y'all can see that. Okay, but this is Proverbs chapter six. Okay, I'm going to start at verse 23. Um, it says, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching of light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. In this case, I almost feel like Kirk Franklin is the one with the smooth tongue here, right? Um, but this is the verse that I really wanted to hone in on. Verse 25, it says, do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. So this is another thing that I pointed out in the video I, I posted this past weekend that adultery starts in the heart. It doesn't start with the action. It starts up here. So we just have to be very careful about um, the thoughts that we let not just coming to our mind because we're humans. Sometimes you're just going to think wild and crazy stuff that you shouldn't be thinking. But the Bible tells us what types of things to meditate on. Things that are lovely, true, beautiful, good, kind, you know. Um, but you should not be meditating on sinful thoughts. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in their heart. So we got to be real careful with that kind of stuff. All right. Kavish, kavish. Okay. <clears throat> Back to Kirk and Amanda. Right there. Right there, right there, right there. Okay. Uh, it's because as a Christian, I am going to want to have moments. Wait, can we just say what my response was to the dinner? She, she said, no, little. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> because you took it very gracefully. And I appreciate that. Yeah, she said she's busy. She ain't got time to be <laughs> going, going, going to dinner with people to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. So, so, so as a Christian, you know, yes, my motive and intent at times will read through, and she's looking at her phone, um, that that I'm going to want to have opportunities to share my faith, mm -hmm. to see if it's something mm -hmm. that can be of interest to someone, but it must be done with grace. It must be done with humility. It cannot be done with an, author, with an authoritarian perspective. Um, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that his... Now that's first Peter 315. If you're gonna share your faith, it should be with grace and humility. That's that's true. That's the bar. Okay, that's it. That's Historically, the these said. are the things that have been the 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 crutches and the undermining of what real Christianity was always created to be. Is is that is that there's this grace and this understanding when you fully understand who you were and what you were without this belief system. And so you lovingly present these ideas and truths to see if they can be something that someone may, may consider and believe. But even through uh, you know just a turn of enlightenment, uh, and especially during the uh, Jesus movement of the early 70s, um, the biggest tool that was used that was weaponized was come to Jesus so you don't go to hell. Yes. I mean, I remember someone telling me that in the 90s. It's scary. You need to go, you, Amanda, if you don't become Christian, you're going to go to hell. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. don't I have to believe in hell to go yeah. there? Wow. Okay. Do you have to believe in hell to go there? Y'all know what? I was talking about this video with a friend of mine the other day. And she said, you know, there's these people out there called sovereign citizens. Some of y'all probably know some of these folks. <laughs> I hope nobody is watching me right now as a sovereign citizen. But these are the ones who are, they're wrapped up in this, I don't even know. I don't even know what you call it, an organization. They feel like because they are so-called sovereign citizens, that if a cop pulls them over or if they have to go to court or something, like the cops shouldn't be able to give them a ticket or take them to jail because they are a sovereign citizen. Now, as much as they believe that, a lot of times when they go to court and try to fight these things, they are sadly mistaken in finding out that they are indeed going to get in trouble for whatever law it is that they have broken. So you don't have to believe in him to go there. Does the, the question should be, does the evidence support that a place called hell exists? I don't know if y'all know this, but there has been studies on what's called near-death experiences. I've been listening to different people talk about this recently. Sean McDowell, um, he interviewed somebody on his channel a few days ago who was in that movie, After Death. Um, Frank Turek has talked about it recently. Gary Habermas has written a few books on it, but these are verified near-death experiences. So these are cases where like someone was on a hospital bed or excuse me, they were like getting surgery or something, right? So they're they're not conscious, but 
while they are unconscious on the table getting their surgery done, like they are mentally like they they're it's almost like they can see their body on the table and they floated out to like third on main street and they see a car accident and so when after the surgery they tell the doctor like hey like i saw a car accident at such and such time and the doctor has verified like yo during that time when they were on my table an accident indeed did occur so it means that there is something that happens like where it's it's not just the physical world so does that prove Christianity? No, but it does show that there is more to this world and our existence than the material world. So Amanda, um, yes, you can go to hell. If hell exists, you don't have to you don't have to believe in it to go there. And I don't understand this idea of let's just leave hell out of the, the conversation when it comes to talking about our faith. Hell is a real place. People should know about it. Now, hell is not the gospel. I I understand the sentiment of you shouldn't tell people um, that the gospel is if you do good things, you'll you'll not go to or you'll go to heaven. If you do bad things, you'll go to hell. The gospel is about being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, through the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, his sinless life, his deity. Those things reconcile us to God if we put our faith in him and in what he accomplished on the cross. But if you are not reconciled to God, you will go to hell. That is what the Bible says. And so if you want to just brush past that, like that's not an important factor to me, something, something about that is very wrong. It's like, why would you tell someone not to uh, participate in taking pharmaceuticals that can make you feel certain ways? Because bad things can happen to you. Why shouldn't you break the law? Because you can go to jail. You know, that's what happens if you do the wrong thing. So if you do not know Christ, if you are not reconciled to God, when you take your last breath, you will not go to heaven. You will indeed go to hell. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I had to say it. I had to say it. I hope that helped somebody. Hey, all right. There it is. Bam. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, yeah. And, and I, and I, and I think that that is when, that is what the issue is in general that makes Christianity look duplicitous. 10 points for Gryffindor for the use of duplicitous. Mm -hmm. I find, I find, this is amazing. I, I want to, there is, okay. So we know that during slavery, Christianity was presented to black folks no in a no very doubt. specific way, no doubt. right? No doubt. So Bible, the slave Bible no was doubt. very lacking no in its totality. Yes. Uh, it was it was curated yes. to create a certain type of person. Yes. Um, and that person was someone that was forgiving, yes. that was looking not at what they have here now, yes. but looking to heaven. And so, yes. you know, this existence yes. on earth was one that was supposed to be yes. about just serving the best yes. that you can because you're really, mm -hmm. the good time yes. is actually going to be later. You don't yeah. got to worry about the good time right now. Yeah. Serve the these white people. Serve these and people. the European imageries of the Bible. <laughs> was so irrelevant to this whole idea on um when we talking about y'all so all over the place tonight this whole live stream has been like a fail but it's okay we're still having a conversation so we'll go here what i was saying was the slave bible was not even most people didn't even have that the slave bible was only distributed to people in the west indies and it wasn't even available until like the last three years of slavery or before the emancipation, I can't remember the dates, but I think like, yeah, it was like right before, right before slavery was, was ended through the Emancipation Proclamation. So anyway, so it was only in the West Indies, most people, most slaves in North America didn't even have it. And the reason why they even redacted the slave Bible was because of the Haitian Revolution. So the Haitian Revolution was when they pretty much cleaned house. And um, yeah, the Haitians was like, we're done with this, right? So anyway, the slave Bible is just to me just a horrible argument to say, oh, black people, we had the slave Bible when most of them did not have the slave Bible. Most of them never seen the slave Bible. And another thing that I was saying is that um, a lot of African slaves were not, they were not open to Christianity just based off the, the early um, move to, to get them to become Christians. A lot of them still held on to their African traditional spiritual traditions. It wasn't until like the first or the second great awakening that they became Christians. So yeah, I, I think Amanda needs to fact check herself there a little bit. Um, <laughs> like said, yes, please keep going. Love it so far. So wait. I'm so sorry, y'all. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the little mute button sometimes. I can hear me, but y'all couldn't hear me. That's so embarrassing. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. We will back up a little bit. 
and let's hide that comment and go back to Kirk and Amanda. Okay. No in its totality, yes. uh, it was it was curated yes. to create a certain type of person. Yes. Um, and that person was someone that was forgiving, yes. that was looking not at what they have here now, yes. but looking to heaven. And so, yes. you know, this existence yes. on earth was one that was supposed to be yes. about just serving the best yes. that you can because you're really mm -hmm. the good time yeah. is actually going to be later. You don't have to go over the good time right now. Yeah. Serve these white people. Serve these. And the European imageries of the blue yes. eyes, Jesus, the blue eyes, like Jesus, the, the BGs, definitely. You know, you know, he looks like the least <laughs> of the BGs. Yeah. Yes. You know, all uh, of those ideals yes. were weapons. So that being said, do we feel like there is a Christianity, there is, a, 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 there is a connection to faith that has to be intrinsically different for Black people in America than in just the general concept of Christianity as a whole. It's, I think that more than that, there needs to be a deconstruction of what Christianity has been over the last several centuries when it, when it comes to the West. Is that Western culture needs a new, um, Jesus needs a PR person. Jesus needs a PR person. It's because uh, the evangelical movement has been trash, it's been garbage, not all evangelicals, but the evangelical movement. The what evangelical would we, just for layman's terms, what would we consider to be the evangelical movement? Like what is in, what is that during, of? During the 50s, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, during the rise, of, during the, rise of, the, of the evangelical or the political right, we started to see where white Christians and politics began to be so, so much intrinsically involved. Attached, where yeah. It was very incestuous, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had these issues where where these, 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 these neo-white ideals that were fabricated and they were packaged in evangelical white Christianity in America to, Y'all heard that right. B, the BCV, the book chapter verse says Jesus needs a what? He said Jesus. He said, he said Jesus needs a PR person. Now, I'm sorry, y'all. I would be afraid to say some mess like that, okay? <laughs> I would be looking like, Lord, you're going to strike me down. Because what? Jesus does not need a PR person. Jesus, <laughs> the gospel is what it is. So let's see, Vision Duty said, the worst kind of coward stands with the enemy of those he or she claims to be a part of and agrees with their sinful and blasphemous critique. Yeah, so that stands for itself. Jesus needs a PR person. That's not like something Michael Todd say, has said in the past, right? We just gotta preach the gospel, okay? And, we, and we, it's not our job to try to make it palatable. Now, I do think, that we can try to make it as we can do what we can to make it persuasive, but not at the expense of the truth of what it is. We can't change the message. We can present it in a in a nice, pretty way, but we can't change the 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 meat of it. Okay, okay, all right, okay. Y'all heard the man. To the point that even churches were silent on even issues of Jim Crow, civil rights, where even one of my uh, heroes, Dr. Billy Graham, told Dr. King he was being too loud. And so if- Why was Billy Graham one of your heroes? It's because I loved his movement at the time of being able to welcome all people to hear the faith. Mm -hmm. at, at, at one time, his, his microphone was so loud right. that he invited all people to be able to hear the faith. You know, that that, that there, there was not a public- uh, a uh, message that did not have a door open to all people, but to find out privately that there were conversations that were having, uh, that were being had on the levels of politics, on the levels of civil rights that were hypocritical yeah. to the teachings of Jesus, it was disappointing. And, and it just also showed uh, the failure and the fragility of, of, of uh, his humanity, just like we see the fragility even, even in the life of Dr. King. So, you know, all of our heroes were flawed, right? You know, we would have yeah, black heroes that were flawed. And so, but, but if the evangelical church collectively would have acknowledged that racism and slavery was a sin, it couldn't have existed in Western culture because there was a period of time that the white church was so powerful in its political stance and its influence in politics that collectively, if the evangelical church in America would have stood together and said that this is a sin against a group of people that are brothers and sisters, it never could have survived in the West the way it did. And they didn't. All right. So I think when I was muted earlier, I referenced a book by Jamar Tisby called The Color of Compromise. Now, that book has, has garnered a lot of controversy for different reasons. I haven't read through the whole thing yet. I haven't gotten to his conclusions, but he does talk about some of the ways that like, yeah, the church kind of kind of failed us um, when it came to, um, you know, just standing up for our rights to be human beings. However, there, the reason that there is no longer slavery in the West is because of the church, okay? It's because of the church. If it had not been for the church, Slavery would not have gone nowhere. So as much as I hate some of the things that happened, and, and there was definitely a lot of mistakes made, but the Christian church literally led the abolitionist movement. So Kirk, I don't understand why he left that out. Help me understand. And they aren't. And they aren't. How does that apply to the LGBTQIA plus community? I think that it applies to all people that are human. Humans should be treated with a level of grace and love the way that Jesus would want them to be treated. Can you just say it one more time? Every human being should be treated with a level of grace, 
mercy and love the way that Jesus would want to treat them. I do not believe in gay churches. I don't believe in white churches. I don't believe in black churches. If you can't go to church and we got to have these side churches where people feel welcome, right. it's a problem with the church. If No, it's not. <laughs> okay. First of all, who is not letting people come to church? Because I go to a great church and our church is not affirming. I mean, we do not affirm any type of relationships that God tells us that we should not affirm. But we do affirm people from all walks of life coming in. We want everyone to come. You don't have to be a Christian to go to church. And the church should welcome in visitors, even if they're not Christian. Like, that's a great mission field. But we're not going to we're not going to pull a uh, William Murphy or. Uh, Jamal Bryant or any of these other clowns who are calling themselves pastors and bishops and apostles who are just and I said what I said clowns we're not going to do what they're doing and affirm what God calls sin so if you're saying we got to change the gospel in order for people to feel comfortable at church then they shouldn't feel comfortable why do you even want to come to church if you don't want to hear the truth of the gospel that is that the problem in there that is not the problem with, with the church that's the problem with the person wanting to change the church to fit whatever their worldview is. That's really why slavery lasted so long. People wanted, they wanted a Jesus that was okay with slavery. That's not what the, that's not what the Bible says. And I'm glad that there was enough Christians to stand up and say, hey, you guys, the Bible does not justify enslaving fellow human beings against their will. That's not at all what the text is saying. So if you're going to let all these other sins walk in, then, then racism is on the table. Slavery is on the table. All types of injustices are on the table. Okay. It appears as though I was not muted this time. So, okay. What y'all saying in the live chat? Pastor Booker says, why don't these hosts invite Jerome Gay, Eric Mason, Damon Richardson to defend Christianity? Kirk Franklin is not qualified. Yeah. But you know what? I feel like Kirk Franklin, I feel like he knows that he's wrong. I just... I really believe that he's just compromising because he wants to be liked. That's what it feels like to me, but I digress. Everybody should be able to come to the same church, get the same When medicine. you say it's a problem with the church, you mean it's a problem with that individual church or with the, 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 the community of church? The, the, the ideology of what the church is from a bibliocentric perspective. Bibliocentric! Never heard that word! Let me take you to Roscoe's. Anyway, I'm saying to you... This is petty, but I just felt like... She was impressed by the word bibliocentric, and yet she thinks she's got Christianity figured out. What a shame. <laughs> what a shame. You know, it's just like, why, why, was that, why was that a mic drop moment? I, help me understand. Bibliocentric? Oh, my goodness. Okay, y'all. Okay. <laughs> this is so good, isn't, it? isn't this good? Because we can keep the little the, the the little side things going all the time. I'm saying that 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 when people have to establish churches yes. for people that do not feel welcome it to church, it is it is counterintuitive to what the church is. It's antithetical. It's because the church is the hospital, and all of us got stuff in us that's sick. Everybody, every human has something. You got to talk. I'm quite sure this morning you woke up and recently. And for no reason at all, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed. And one of them told an ankle. I'm sorry, y'all, but I am not paying you two, so we're going to have to work through these ads. I'm so sorry. Apple, this something. toe right here. Look at it. See? see that toe? Ladies and gentlemen, she got a toe that ain't like the other toe. It's bruised because I kicked a box. There you go. As beautiful as she is, as pretty as this dress that Deborah got on. <laughs> that was her name. We called her Deborah. I look like Deborah. I also really got yeah. a very thick neck. This beautiful lady named standing in for, for uh, Amanda. Amanda. Deborah has a bruised toe. So guess what? Mm -hmm. She should be able to go to the same hospital with somebody that just got shot. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the hospital. That's what the church was supposed to be for all of God's people because all of us got something that needs the physician to see. What do you feel like faith does? Y'all killing me in these comments. <laughs> Mission Beauty said he too busy want to take her out to eat. <laughs> it appears that way to me too, bro. Um, is she an atheist or a spiritualist? She'll get into this a little bit later, but I think she is her own God. She has um, created a God that suits herself, as my buddy Ray Comfort would say. So yeah, she's kind of all over the place in terms of healing. How does faith work in your opinion? If we're going to this hospital, how does the implement how does the implementation of faith work within us to heal? Great question. Any doctor that's worth his degree, no matter what he has studied, no matter what he's able to offer, he understands that healing also 
is this co-participation between the doctor and the patient. Before he prescribes any, any amount of medicine, what does every doctor say to the patient? Tell me where it hurts. Mm -hmm. It's because you have to heal to, I mean, you have to reveal to heal. Okay. God only heals what we reveal. And so okay. if there are things that I do not either acknowledge or accept that in my life needs to have this, this, uh, this, this, this trajectory shift, uh -huh. then no matter how smart the doctor is, he can't prescribe what you don't admit. Tell it to my ex. He can't prescribe what you don't admit, baby. You got to talk to him. <laughs> Silver and gold. <laughs> Silver and gold. Right. And, I, of Jesus and I don't know who that ex is, but I'm telling you right now, bro, you're a fool. You should have fought for this one, bro. I'm sorry. Next question. Let's go. Where do you feel like uh, faith is? Am I the only person? Every time he makes these kind of comments, I'm just like, I died a little bit on the inside because, Kurt, what is you <laughs> she talking about? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Uncle Kurt. What do you think? He's being misused at present. Mm. And when I say faith, I mean the concept, right? Because I feel like there is a wielding, a weaponizing of the concept of faith that is being mm. used. And it's pulling in people who are genuinely yeah. like connected to yeah. faith. Like it's pulling in people who are yeah. genuinely in the hospital, right? Yeah. Who are genuinely saying like, I need, it pulls in people who are, I don't want to use the term weak because that's not what I, that's what they look at them as, yeah. but it's really just the vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. And I think unfortunately that has been the narrative of, of this organized idea of creating some type of construct of getting into this theist, this, this theistic belief system, right? And we see it early in the Roman Catholic movement and, 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 and its ancestors' relationship with the church and politics in, in, in Europe and people paying for healings and miracles in the right. early church, you know? And then we see during the Protestant Reformation how Martin Luther was very uh, intentional by making sure that people understood you don't need man to be able to get to God. Oh, oh, oh. Say that again? Well, we see through the, uh, we see through the Reformation uh, and, and we see Martin Luther standing. So we're talking there. about Martin Luther, like Lutheran, like yes, note yeah. on the door. Mm -hmm. yes, okay. Yeah, thesis, yeah. And once again, humans, we, we create this, 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 this set, this, this dumbed down uh, 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 context of these bigger moments yes. that were supposed to be for everyone. And then we create new smaller movements yes. from these bigger moments. Yes. And so um, what, what happened at that moment was not supposed to be this whole new denomination. or uh, No? No, 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 no. Not, 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 it was not supposed to be the move of the Martin. It was not supposed to be the birth of the Lutheran church. Right. Yeah, it was yeah, supposed yeah. to be a re... It was a Protestant, it was a Protestant uh, 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 reshaping of that, of that there should be this door open to everybody right. that can rock with this guy. That, 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 that we're saying that we think is dope. We think he, we think he, um, we believe there's enough evidence to show that he's God's kid. And it's not something that was just that was just created at a, at a council through uh, several people that had this belief system. It, it existed 400 years before Islam. It, it's something that we believe has enough contextualized truths that can point that there's enough academic information that we can believe and trust that this dude is who he said he is. Did he say he was God's kid? He said it. Yeah, he said it. And I know that there's. Well, that's one thing Kirk Franklin got right in his conversation. Well, that's not the only thing. He did he he did affirm that Jesus is the son of God, which is a lot more than some of these other gospel celebrities or whatever would have been willing to do nowadays. So he got that right, but. There's a lot of other stuff he didn't get right. Well, let's talk about that, it. That, that, that there are liberal uh, uh, schools of thought that believe that these writings were, were, were fabricated to, 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 to say things that, 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 that he may not have said. But we believe that there's enough manuscripts okay. and there's enough uh, uh, historical documentation to support that when you have, because see, remember, Jesus was not. This was another good point, the manuscript evidence. So one of the awesome things about our Bible is that we have so many manuscripts, like anyone who says the Bible has been tampered with really just does not understand how canonization works because the Bible trumps all books from antiquity manuscript wise. Like, first of all, these, these letters and the New Testament letters were written early. So within the first century of all this stuff happening, they've already got the papers down pat, like it's on papers being distributed throughout the churches. Some of these other books from antiquity, like the Odyssey, and um, I can't even remember some of the other ones, but like they're written hundreds of years after the person existed, like Alexander the Great. Like the first source for him was like three or 400 years after he lived. It's Julius Caesar, several hundred years after he lived. Jesus had people writing about him within decades of his life. So that mixed with, again, thousands, like we've got like 5,000 New Testament uh, manuscripts. No one else got that. Y'all know what these other ancient texts got? Some of them have like three manuscripts 
five manuscripts. Okay, so that was a that was a W for Kirk. All right, let's go. Thank you, Kirk. Thanks, Uncle Kirk. The only person in the Middle East that was making claims at this time. Okay. In that ancient world, there were many people making claims of, 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 of deity. So it's kind of like how like there's a lot of like MCs who make claims like, I'm the king of the South. Exactly. And then and crucifixions were happening every day. They were happening all, you know, three or four times a day. Jeez Louise. Area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, it was a modern way of, of penalizing crime. Right. And so and, and so if 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 this was the landscape of the era that, 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 that we were walking in in this ancient time, Thousands of years of Jewish belief systems were not being changed. You didn't see people changing their diets. You didn't see people changing the different type of clothes they wore, um, the different days that they worshipped on. This guy, this 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 one guy, in, in in an era where it was paganistic. You know, Rome was a pagan society at this time, and so all of these people now want to start being being martyrs and are being willing to die. It's because Nero at the time, mm. the ruler Nero, he was tarring people. They considered themselves Christians and using them as streetlights. So 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 a hundred years over over a hundred years before almost three hundred years before Constantine, you had people in that era that were proclaiming and professing to be Christians. Why so, was it so dangerous to him that he was? Why was the concept of Christianity so dangerous to Nero that he felt the need to make examples of his followers? And that's right. Before Kirk answers that, I just wanted to highlight some of these comments from from the people in the chat who scholars a little bit. Seiko was like Homer's Iliad. Yeah, that's a, a work from antiquity. Sorry, I'm trying to. Can y'all see me? That's a work from antiquity. Um, and Vision Duty says, yeah, Paul wrote Galatians in 48 AD, the very first New Testament writing. Yes, I love it. The apologetics. Okay, okay. I think it's so beautiful. I think that that right there. I'm asking, why? Well, 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 well is I think that that's what legitimizes the story of the belief of faith, of, of the Christian faith, is because these were not influential people. Think about it. When you talk about this, 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 this region of the world and the people that were believing in this space, they did not have the power. Rome had the power. So what made it so powerful that it was a threat? Because it was true. They they saw so what it, what was I guess my question is like what was threatening about its truth? It's because its truth was going against everything that was antithetical to paganistic ideals and beliefs. Uh, 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 um, if you have a rulership that is that is having games where the games are killing people for sport. Yes, <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying. And and the way that it was treating uh, uh, its poor. Yes, and, and, and in the Colosseum, yeah, 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 all of that. Fights, yes. And then now this belief system that started to rise and bubble that was saying that these are your brothers and these are your sisters and these are your equals and they should be treated with with this certain space and that there's a kingdom. It that undermines we're... power. Yeah. But the beautiful part of who it was coming from, the movement was coming from peasants that had no ability to overthrow the leadership. And they continued to grow, that these people were willing to be martyrs. And again, Jesus was not the only guy making these claims at the time. So what was so unique about this guy that people that had been eating a certain way for thousands of years were willing to change their, their belief systems of what days they worship, they, uh, 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 all of these, because, I mean, you know, Jewish customs and Jewish ideals are very deeply rooted mm -hmm. and entrenched in the people that believe them. And so these were Jewish people that were not only Jewish by, uh, by faith, they were Jewish by culture. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were Jewish by race. That, 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 that many of them, by the droves, were beginning to change all of these things that they've been taught for thousands of years for this one peasant guy that died on the cross in the middle of all these other people. That's what I'm saying is that that in itself is the beautiful miracle of this truth that no one can argue against because it happened. People, people changed their lives and their lives were interrupted in ways that we had never seen before in anyone that had made these type of claims of evil. Is All right, so Kirk went on a little church history tangent and I felt like it was pretty good and it was so good that I looked up an article on this um, is this it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me show y'all this right quick. And I know it's going to be like small because I haven't figured out quite how to do like Zoom and all that on here. So I do apologize. Um, but I want to show you guys this article. It's called How Did Christianity Prevail in Ancient Rome and What We Can Learn From It? Because what Kirk is, what he's responding to is this idea that Christianity was, it, it became a worldwide religion because Christians, I guess, bullied everyone into becoming Christians. And that's just not what happened. Um, so there's this article. Let me see if I can find a share screen. Let me see which one. How did Christianity prevail? I hope y'all can see that. I think y'all can see it. Um, but this is by Sean McDowell. All right. <clears throat> there is a list. He says there are many factors that can help explain a little bit bigger. I'm sure there's a way to zoom in, y'all. Forgive my, forgive my, um, my ignorance on the tech stuff tonight. But okay, I'll just read it. Hopefully, y'all can somewhat see it. There are many factors that can help explain the growth of Christianity. But as her title points out, in Destroyer of the Gods. So if y'all want to hear more about this, read more about this. Get this book, Destroyer of the Gods. Christian distinctives must be taken into consideration as a piece of the puzzle. 
consider a few Christian distinctives which are often taken for granted today. Oh, no, that's not where I want to go. That's not where I want to go. It is, is it? Hmm. Okay, I think that is it. Okay. When people worship God, Christians claim they should withdraw from worshiping the gods of their families, cities, and peoples. The exclusivist stance of Christianity was so offensive that Christians were often labeled atheists. Christians emphasize that there is one transcendent God who passionately loves his people and can be related to personally. Pagans often spoke of the love of God towards humans in terms of philia, which indicates friendship. But Christians spoke of God with the Greek term agape, which connotes a deep love and firm commitment to the loved one. Christianity was a bookish religion. Like Jews, Christians read scripture publicly, produced voluminous, voluminous numbers of texts and committed remarkable resources to copying and disseminating them widely. In fact, in their eagerness to disseminate scripture, Christians were at the leading edge of book technology of the second and third centuries. Christianity uniquely linked religious beliefs with ethical living. As a result, Christians were on the leading edge of overturning popular practices in ancient Rome, such as infant exposure, gladiator battles. That's one of the things Kirk mentioned. Um, abuse, physical abuse of children and sexual perversion. Christians uniquely called men to the same kind of sexual loyalty demanded of women. So this is one of the reasons or several of the reasons why Christianity was um, popular at its onsite because it actually solved a lot of problems for people. It made people's lives better except for this whole persecution thing. Now that part was tough, but when we're talking about like family life and healthy living and things that would actually promote human dignity. Like Christianity had all of those components. And the last point was Christianity was uniquely diverse. In ancient Rome, there was social stratification between men and women, slaves and free, rich and poor. But Christians began with assemblies that were diverse in gender, age, and social status. Even the least important members of Roman society, such as women and slaves, were considered equal members in the church. So people like Christianity because it was a good idea, okay? It, it was not forced on folks. It, people wanted this. Like, um, infant exposure that I talked about in here, I don't know if y'all know how awful that is, but in the Roman Empire, they would, if, if they didn't want their babies, they would just leave them out in the woods or on the top of a building and just let them burn to death or let wild animals come eat them or let some you know, some random person could just take these kids and do whatever they wanted to do with them. And um, I, who was I listening to? I think it was Bill Federer. I heard Bill Federer is a historian and Frank Turk was interviewing him. And he talked about how a lot of Roman women, because they didn't have um, the choice sometimes to keep these children, their husband didn't want them. So they would leave their babies like on the doorsteps of Christians and then just run off and let Christians raise the babies because they knew that Christians valued life the life of children, the life of infants. So Christianity was a really, really good idea back then and still today. So um, yeah, that quick, Kirk, quick. <laughs> Kirk made some really good points there. All right, let me bring that back on the screen. Okay. All right, we're almost, we're getting somewhere. Is it fair to suggest that there have, okay, walk with me on this. I'm gonna walk with you in your house shoes. When I hear the story of, you know, Jesus and him awakening something in, in peasants, right? What I feel like is being awakened is self-worth, value that has not been provided by society. And that, 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 this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And what I see is we have, we have had centuries upon centuries upon centuries of humans who have decided who is valuable and who is not based on their own egoism, based on their own greed, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like people just decided like, I'm a God. And then they were, they were, they were able to convince other people they're a God. What I think is specific, Specifically, that's okay. That's, that's the part of the country we're in. Okay. <laughs> what I think is specifically uh -huh. unique about the story of Jesus is that it was not about it was not about awakening these things in people in order for them to take power against other people. It was more it was about being able to have a um, a system of value for yourself that you can exist in this life with, that you can trust in, that other people can trust in, right? That other people can connect to. So for me, God exists within all of us. For me, I see God as a uh, an interconnectivity that flows through all of us beings because we are made of magic. We don't even truly understand what we're made of. Somehow we are yeah. Yeah. atoms and yeah. matter that is combined. And then our brain is this 
Y'all, y'all, did y'all hear that? So Christianity is off the table. Christianity can't be true. But magic, magic is on the table. Do y'all hear this kind of stuff? This is see, this I got another scripture for that. Okay, got another scripture for that. This one is in Col- Colossians 2. Let me bring that one up right quick. Because how do we go from I, I like the truth and I like facts to magic? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why are we like this? Okay, let me let me share this, um, this other screen right quick. This is Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Hope y'all can see that. I probably can't because it's super small. But okay. Colossians 2 verses. 2 verses 8. Right here. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. I don't know if people understand or realize this, but a lot of times the further you get away from Christianity and truth, I could just, you get away from just common sense. Because again, why is the resurrection, which is something that's well documented throughout history, why is that not something that Amanda is willing to really research and consider seriously, but magic is on the table? Help me understand. I honestly I don't want to understand because that's just ridiculous, but that's where we are. All right, <clears throat> let's get back to the video. I mean, good night, everyone. Thank you for it. For those of you who are about to go to bed, I know it's late. I'm <clears throat> I'm still gonna be here for a little minute because I just found this just this is just good stuff. But um, uh, yeah, so let's let's get back into Intricate. it machine that is still not fully understood and we give off energy like humans physically give off that we combust right we combust that's why when people come into a room you can feel like what's what's this right and so that energy to me is god for me amanda and that is why the connectivity of each other is so important because we are a higher power that is moving beyond just our consciousness it's moving outside of us all the time so when i hear when i when i hear you speak so fervently and so honestly about you know what jesus has been able to awaken in people i don't think that there aren't other people that have come through this uh through this expanse of time that have I, sorry, I do think there are other people who have come through this expanse of time who have been able to do that for people, right? Like, and I don't think it has been at the same, maybe not at the same level, maybe not the same uh, effect. Um, but I think what is important to me is always just coming back to the bottom line that everyone, I believe, deserves to feel like they belong here. Mm. And that is not effective for power structures. Mm. Mm. Facts, facts, facts. You know, and and I think, Amanda is making a lot of moral claims and she's acting like she has the moral high ground, but she doesn't have anything to ground her morality in other than herself, it seems like, because she basically said that she is her own God. So if she's her own God, then that means she can make up her own morals. And I'm sorry, y'all, I don't want to live my life based on Amanda Seals' morals because she's just as flawed of a human being as I am. And this is the problem with atheism. Um, Atheists do not like to accept this, but if God doesn't exist, then objective morality does not exist. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, some things can be an opinion, right? Vanilla ice cream versus strawberry ice cream, like that's a matter of opinion. but Unaliving someone, um, like in in the sense of premeditated, you know, things that that you can go to jail for, that's always morally wrong. But without God, you can't say for sure that that is morally wrong. It's just your opinion if you're an atheist. If you're being consistent with your worldview, you can't say that God doesn't exist, but that more objective morality also exists. It just it doesn't quite work. Um, and I have another thing I wanted to pull up. This is, I got plenty of articles tonight. I know it's late to be talking about apologetics. Actually, it's already tomorrow. (laughs) Happy Tuesday, family. It's already tomorrow. But, um, y'all know I love Frank Turk. I know I I keep dropping his name and the cross-examine is the, the ministry that he started. And he has so many good articles on his website, though. He's got a blog on here that kind of breaks down what's called the moral argument. And I just wanted to read a few lines from that. Um, Let's see. Is it this one? It's right here. Okay, the moral argument. Oh, it's so small. It's so little. I'm going to learn how to zoom one of these days. But right now, maybe if I put myself in the corner, then 
then. Okay. All right. So it's called the moral argument for the existence of God. I'll also drop this one in the live chat here in just a second. Okay. So the moral argument for the existence of God refers to the claim that God is needed to provide a coherent ontological foundation for the existence of objective moral values and duties. The argument can be summarized in the following syllogism. Premise one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Premise two, objective moral values and duties do exist. And the conclusion is therefore God exists. So it goes on to say, since this is a logically valid syllogism, the atheist, in order to maintain his non-belief in God, must reject at least one of the two premises. By objective morality, we mean a system of ethics which universally pertains irrespective of the opinions or tastes of human persons. So, for example, they talk about the Holocaust. They say the Holocaust was morally wrong, irrespective of what Hitler and the Nazis believed about it. And it would have remained morally wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and compelled everyone into compliance with their values. So if Hitler and, I, and, and the Nazis won, and they convinced that they convinced everybody that what they stood for, which we all know what they stood for, it was wrong back then and it's still wrong today. And I hope y'all can read in between the lines of what I'm saying. But if they were able to convince everybody that what they did was OK, it's still morally wrong because all morality is grounded in God. OK, the article goes on to say this view known in philosophy as moral realism contrasts with moral relativism which maintains that no one is objectively correct or incorrect with respect to their moral values and judgments. That kind of sounds like what um, what Amanda Seals is into, even though she said she's spiritual, but she, she kind of almost sounds like um, an atheist in a sense but I don't think she's an atheist anyway. Um, okay, so it goes on to say, most people want to uphold premise two of the moral argument. So premise two again was objective moral values and duties do exist. So most people will acknowledge that objective moral values exist. After all, if there are no objective ethics, then who is to say that Hitler was objectively morally wrong? Humans have an intuitive sense of right and wrong. The moral argument requires only that at least some actions are objectively right or wrong. So torturing children for pleasure is objectively morally wrong. I hope we can all agree on that. Premise one relates to the perfect standard against which everything else is measured. God being the only morally perfect being is the standard against which all other things are judged. Moreover, in the absence of Theism, nobody has been able to conceive of a defensible grounding for moral values. Now, if y'all want to read the rest of it, I'm going to go ahead and drop this in the comments section because I do think this is really good stuff. But um, at the end of the day, if you don't have, without God, once you throw God away, then you don't have any reason to call anything good or bad. It's, it's all just your opinion. And I'm sorry. I, if you look at the opinions of just, I don't know, a, a group of people, a small group of people, you're going to get a whole bunch of different ideas on what things are good and what things are bad. So I personally am glad that humans are the ones who decide ultimately what is right, and what is wrong, especially humans like like Miss Amanda Seals. Because I don't know if y'all saw this on Twitter a couple weeks ago. She kind of, I'm not going to say she got canceled, but she got a lot of backlash for being anti-Semitic because she is anti-Semitic. I mean, there's there's no other way to say that. And so, yeah, she she deserved that backlash. So it's like, if you think it's okay to harm people just because they exist, then I, you're not someone I want to be taking my moral cues from. But that's another whole conversation. Okay, we're going to get back to the video. <clears throat> I think that both can be true at the same time. As, as I believe that, 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 that two statements that I would say is that, once again, he was not the only one making these claims at the time. But that, was he the only one actually doing the thing? I believe that there were others is because when we start to see um, that, that, that because you have these, these other gospels, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. you know what I mean? They yeah. tell these other stories. Exactly. And so, and so that's but they maybe didn't have the, the same, <laughs> they'd have the chutzpah, right? Yeah, yeah the yeah, charisma. Yeah. But, but they but didn't I, have the same connectivity though to. It's, I forgot they talked about this, the other gospels. So y'all know like the reason why the Gnostic gospels are not included in the New Testament. I'm sure some of my Bible scholars out here already know this, but. They were written like way too late. One of the one of the stipulations for being considered an apostle is that you had to have walked with Jesus personally 
or you had to have personally known someone who walked with Jesus. So this is why having documents from the first century when Jesus actually lived is important. You know, like I can believe what Peter said about Jesus because Peter personally knew Jesus. Now, someone who lived, say, three or four hundred years after the fact and says, OK, I'm going to slap Thomas's name on this gospel or, you know, anybody else, Mary's name on this gospel. When, you know, y'all, y'all are too far removed to you didn't know Jesus. It's just like the same reason why we can't accept what the Quran says about the historical Jesus, because Muhammad lived five or six hundred years after Jesus lived. He did not know him personally. So we cannot accept what Muhammad said about Jesus. So, yeah, for I feel like Kirk Franklin kind of dropped the ball on answering that question. It, it's not just because, oh, people just we just chose these these gospels and we liked them better, but we didn't like the other ones just because it wasn't, you know, just some flimsy. I don't like this one. I do like this one. It was like, no, the gospels that we have in our Bible were written by eyewitnesses and the Gnostic gospels were not, they, they just, <laughs> they're not legitimate sources for the historical Jesus. Okay. But, but, but then the other conversation or the other question is then also, then why him? But it's, it's, yeah, no, and, but that's yeah, real. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. real. I mean, I think and that's I think the thing that we don't know. But I do believe, though, is I do believe that there's a fingerprint that you can begin to see, even even that it uniquely was the same place that was the origin of the beginning of man, where we see that the first man was found historically and scientifically. We also see the influence that he had in that particular uh, region of the world. And then the forefathers of the faith were also a man of African descent. You had origin, you had Tertullian, you had uh, uh, of the very first church in Alexandria. And so you start to see that this started to spread. And we historically, historically, there has not been an individual or a moment that not only impacted the region the way it did. And 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 again, this region where everyone became this underdog that began to take over with, with influence that changed. We, we have never historically seen a race of people abandon everything that was intricately wired within them mm -hmm. for the sake of not being willing to die for this case for centuries. And they were doing it for centuries. I mean, centuries before the rule of Constantine, we see these poor people make these claims that got them killed. And then we saw the spread of it and the power and the structure of it with our own people, people of African descent. Europe did not influence Africa with Christianity. It did. Africa, yes. No, Africa influenced Europe. That they, they, Yes, um, um, there is a guy named Thomas C. Odom, a white man from Princeton, that wrote an incredible book years ago. And it's a brilliant read, How Africa Reshaped the Christian Mind. Africa was the hub and the genesis of the Christian faith. Tertullian, uh, you look at Augustine, you look at origin. These are all men of these are African men that were the forefathers of the Christian faith. I mean, I don't know enough to challenge, so I'm just not. Yeah, but, but I promise you, it, <laughs> I promise you, it is brilliant. Mm -hmm. it is, and I think that that's the problem. See, see, what you said is so beautiful is that there is not enough historical academic conversations happening in defense of the Christian faith. So now we have all of this revisionist but I history. I tell you though, I so I just want to I want to see. Here's a. I wanted to um, this is the book Kirk is talking about: How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind. And y'all should get this book because it is a great book. And Thomas Olden talked about a lot of the names that Kirk Franklin just named. His point was, you know, people think that black people didn't become Christians until slavery. And that's just not true. So he talked about the early church fathers. This is why church history, which I, I'm just now starting to learn a little bit of church history. Right. But Christianity starts in, in Jerusalem, in Israel. You know, first the first Christians were Jews. but you have like a lot of a lot of the early church fathers were from the they were from Africa. Origin was from Africa. Um, who else did he say? Tertullian. Tertullian is the one who coined the term Trinity. Um, Saint Augustine, who was like you know everybody knows Saint Augustine, right? Athanasius. These are people from the early the the early years of the, the early centuries of the church. So um, even before Constantine. And his point was like what Thomas Olin writes about in this book is how. Um, a lot of the European theologians were looking back to the African scholars, the, the first Christians in Africa, who the first the church fathers in Africa, and using a lot of the theology that they had kind of sorted out. And like Martin Luther, he I forget which one of the church fathers that he really kind of you know used a lot of his material. But the point is that Christianity is not a quote unquote white man's religion. Um, Christianity has a very rich history in Africa. So y'all need to pick up this book and share it with your woke friends who think that no African knew about Jesus until slavery. That's just totally untrue. 
okay. Thing. I don't think that the Christian faith would need to be defended if it wasn't so often being used to offend. Fair, fair. Because fair. I don't even think it matters if Jesus was real or not, if whatever we're using is helping people. I don't, I genuinely don't. If, I just don't want him to be. I just don't want him to be limited. So she, first of all, you already saw when Kirk Franklin was schooling her on African church history, she was, she really didn't want to believe it. She, her body language was saying, I don't care what you say. I think that's hogwash. So I don't, I don't anticipate that Amanda is going to go pick up that book and actually research what it is that Kirk Franklin said. But she just basically say, I don't care if Christianity is true. I don't like it because it's offensive. As if everybody world, you, <laughs> just because something offends you doesn't make it any less true, right? Like try to tell a drug addict to, to stop doing drugs. They're probably going to be offended, right? Right? But is them being addicted to a hard substance ultimately going to help them in life? If Christianity is true, if God is real, if heaven is real, if hell is real, and someone go like, once you die, you're going to figure out, you're going to find out for sure whether or not, you know, what Christianity, if Christians were right about the gospel and all that. But you should want to know that beforehand, right? Right? I, I'm sorry, y'all. I just, my heart breaks for her because I know she's a smart woman, but because she has, she is so in love with the ways of this world and her own views that she is not willing to even investigate truth claims. She's just like, whatever makes you feel good, you know, just do that. But if Buddhism will lead you to hell, if Islam will lead you to hell, if Jehovah's Witness and, and Mormonism and atheism and universalism and all these things will lead you to hell, then that's worth debating, right? I think so. To this self-help book. That, that's what I'm saying. Is that, no, I don't yeah, think it's yeah. self-help. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a, it's, it's not just self-help. It's also a, a, a life path, right? I think that it's guidance, right? It's mm -hmm. a it's a north star. Mm -hmm. It's a beacon. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. preach, it's it's preach. the uh, yeah, yeah. it's on, the sensors again. on your car when you're going you know when you're on, going Deborah. into the other lane on, and, goes, doo, 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 and it brings you so silly. So like you know we we all have different things that you know not different things. We all have different methods for that. My issue is that I think we end up putting so much effort into like I, I see this on the internet all the time where people like want to respond with like Bible verses to defend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is irrelevant. Right. Because agree, ultimately agree. I'm like, you wouldn't have to defend this yeah. if you weren't using this to yeah. harm. And I can't argue against that. I I because I have no rebuttal to that truth. And 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 I think that, that has been the most uh disheartening part of the journey that I've had to walk through over the last two decades as a Christian. Harm who? Who are Christians harming today? You know what Christians are doing today? The same thing that the early Christians were doing back in the day, fighting for life. Because y'all, this whole abortion issue, it, it's just so disgusting to me that people will fight to do what they're doing to these babies in the womb. And I'm not saying this to try to make anyone feel bad who may have had that procedure. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that procedure is, is just, it's vicious. And for me, I, I wasn't as passionate about that particular issue until I realized the process for abortion and how evil and wicked it is. So I said all that to say, you know, just as we talked about the exposure thing, right? About Romans leaving their kids out for animals to eat them or for for them to be just die from the, the, the hot sun. Well, that's just as bad as what abortion is today. It's it's evil, it's disgusting. It, Torturing these kids and doing what they're doing to these kids in the womb is something that we as Christians should care about. So we are the Christians are the ones who are really in front of the pro-life movement. And there's plenty of people who aren't even Christians who are pro-life. Right. But Christians are trying to save lives. And even with um, what they're trying to do with kids and, and changing genders and all this stuff. Right. Like it's getting scary out there. Christians are the ones saying, don't let five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds go under the knife before they're even mature enough to understand what it is they're doing. So it's not Christians who are trying to hurt people. And I'm not saying that Christians are perfect. My goodness, we all make mistakes. The church makes mistakes. But y'all, take if you take the church out of this world, it will be such a dark place. 
really. You wouldn't even have Western civilization. That's another whole conversation there. But here's another book that I want to recommend to y'all. It's called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? Y'all, Christians, Christianity is the reason why women aren't considered second class citizens in the West. It's the reason why exposure, exposure of babies stopped. It's the reason why adoptions and hospitals and, and institutions of higher learning were started. It's because of Christians. Like even y'all realize that certain cultures would practice cannibalism. Christians even help people to realize how evil cannibalism is, right? There's this funny story in the book where this uh, this guy, he saw some, I think some, um, some person holding the Bible. And I don't think they were like, I don't think they were European descent or African American. I can't remember. I think they might have been, I don't know. But he said, oh, man, I can't believe you believe that Bible. And the guy basically told him, man, if I didn't have this Bible, my ancestors would have been eating you. And it's just like, oh, that's kind of scary, right? Right. But because he was converted to Christianity, the light bulb went off like, oh, I guess cannibalism isn't a great idea. Yeah, that's right. OK. All right. Where was I going with that? So, yeah, y'all pick up this book. What if Jesus had never been born by D. James Kennedy? Y'all, it, it's mind blowing. So the world would be a very dark place. That's not been for Christians. I don't know why Kirk Franklin isn't doing a better job of defending everything that Christians have done over the centuries. But let us continue is to see uh, to see the deficiencies mm. of, of the faith that I've subscribed to, that I've given my life to. And I know that as um, often in the Christian community, there's a lot of things being pointed at culture right now. Culture is the problem. This culture is Well, they've been getting at you about that, right? Like you're doing too much culture with your Christianity. Since day Quit one. making these people stomp. Since day one. Since people day having one. too much fun. I've been gyrating too much since day one. I've been gy gyrating too much. I've been driving I've been... low for Jesus. <laughs> when that horrible, did you remember that? When that Shout out to but it was good, though. It was good and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was, good, terrible. It was good, yeah. terrible. And so I do think that that is the reason why you, it, I said earlier that I do think that there needs to be a new PR person in place is I think that there needs to be something. And when I say that- You know what the best PR for Jesus would be? Loudly challenging those who are misusing his image. Amen. That is what I believe. That is me coming, that is me, that's coming from me as a non-Christian. I am, I am willfully Amen. saying that I am ignorant in a lot of the theology that you're referring to. Well, no, 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 no. That's not the theology I'm referring to. I'm talking about academic history. Okay, so I am willfully yeah. ignorant to the academic history. She is clearly willfully ignorant to the academic history because like he just said, he was talking about church history. He's talking about people and she's talking about theology. Like, Amanda, <laughs> like, read a book. Y'all remember Steve Irving used to say that? Read a book. My goodness. I just, uh, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed. And I'm sure y'all are too. And Thunder, <laughs> Thunder Scorpion, thank you for being here. Oh, my goodness. I just, I just, let's keep religion out of politics. Sir, you wouldn't even have politics had it not been for religion, okay? But that's another whole conversation. Uh, but I, I think it is, it's okay. For instance, you know, people are very like, oh, Democrats, Republicans are the same thing. We need to, we, you know, there needs yeah. to be a new marketing plan for Democrats. Right. And I'm like, the marketing plan for Democrats should literally just be shutting down Republicans. Like you don't need to come with your own mega like uh, yeah. saying and motto. Yeah. It should yeah. be action. Yes. It should yes. be action. I feel yes. like there was a time where the black church was synonymous with yes. not only Christianity, but yes. with action. Yes. Yes. Right. Like yes. Reverend Shuttlesworth, yeah. Reverend yeah. the yeah. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther yeah. King. Like, yes. the, you know what I mean? Yes. And yes. even if we take it beyond the church and we take it to the nation, you know, there was mm -hmm. it yep. was synonymous yes. with yes. we're not just teaching faith. Yes. We're not just yes. teaching community. Yeah. We're teaching challenging right. and action. And shout out to the nation for what they did during that movement. Correct. That, 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 that they were very powerful in empowering our people to be able to see above and past depression. See, this is another reason why I was annoyed. <laughs> so so the nation of Islam gets a high five from Kirk Franklin. But evangelicalism is the worst thing to hit America since. <laughs> Y'all make it make sense. The Nation of Islam has been better to Kirk Franklin, I guess, than than the Christian Church. I you can't make this. And up. don't y'all say faith without works? What's how's it go? Mm -hmm. Y'all, yeah, yeah, uh, y'all, us, yeah, yeah. We, we say or the uh, text says faith without works is dead. Yeah, that's what it says. It's so funny, y'all. Yeah, and and <laughs> See, I, do, I have to yeah. say y'all because I understand, I understand clearly because you. I think it's also very necessary for people to understand that people who do not believe the same thing can have a conversation and can yeah. come to understandings that are still in a high vibration. There's your precepts. You see, you, yes. that, 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 that you still subscribe to the precepts. I think that for someone like me who is committed to the, to the validity and to the longevity of a belief system that has constantly been attacked and destroyed even by its own internally. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yes. sometimes, sometimes it has been this cancerous space where
that we are destroying ourselves mm -hmm. by the execution of being hypocritical in the same love that we say that we need to receive that we don't give to others. And so somebody who is uh, who's very passionate, as you can see, I'm very passionate and committed to how we love people that we have always painted to be unlovable. And I think that that is the most uh, um, horrific uh, uh, billboard for any belief system that you want people to sign up to. So where does the intersection of faith and politics exist for you now? Like you talked about how there was a time in the 50s where it became like, you know, very intrinsically connected. Yes. And I feel like we are in that time again, like in a yeah. very loud way where they're very uh, indiscriminately citing Jesus as yes. a reason for yes. discriminating against whoever, 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 whoever. Is I believe that any gospel that people that's, that any gospel that people sign up to that is not in its totality you are part of the problem, that, 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 that there's a loud hypocrisy. God cares about not only the womb, he cares about the tomb. When you only care about a baby, that you believe in what, what, whatever your scientific ideal of what the baby is, when the baby is, but after the baby is born, you do not have, you don't have policies and procedures in place Correct. to be able to help the community, to be able to continue to raise the life of that baby. You are a lie and you are a hypocrite, and that is not of Jesus. And so anybody that signs up to any community. You know what's not of Jesus? Abortion. Abortion is not of Jesus. I got another article I want to share with y'all because y'all when I heard that, I was like, Kirk, what in the CRT are you talking about? What are you talking about? I we talking about <laughs> I'm sorry, Kirk. I, I can't rock with you on that one. But um let's let's talk about what he just said, this whole wound to the tomb argument. Cause I was like, what's the good response to that? Mm. Go oh, the transcript. There it is. Kirk Franklin says, if you don't want to take care of the baby for the whole life, then you should not stand against abortion. That is what I. That is how I interpreted what he just said. Y'all, let me know if I'm wrong about that. Okay, so I don't know if y'all know who Scott Klusendorf is. I'm just kind of becoming familiar with his platform and his ministry, um, but he has. He's just been a pro-life advocate for many, many years. I got to get his book. I haven't read it yet, but he's got a website and everything. I think it's called Case for Life. But he addressed exactly what Kirk Franklin just said. And so I'm going to share this with y'all too. Let's see. Let's see. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Technology is eating me up tonight, y'all. Bear with me. With me. I'm so happy for your patience with your dear sister Titus. Okay. All right. Scott Klusendorf. This is on the Gospel Coalition. All right. It says, as a Christian, I should care about trafficking. I should care about refugees. I should care about immigrants. And if I'm not, there's something wrong. In my Christian worldview, James is very clear that godliness entails caring for the widow, caring for those who are in need. But it does not follow from this, men and women, that the operational objectives of the pro-life movement must be broad and inclusive as well. And the point I want to argue today is simply this, that pro-life organizations should resist, indeed, must resist any attempt by those who label themselves whole life to rewrite the operational objectives of the pro-life movement. So pro-life is about saving babies from abortion. It's not about sending kids to college. It's not about um, all these other, th the rest of the life. It's the, uh, the main objective is to stop kids from being aborted, okay? So that's what he's saying there, but let's keep going. He said, I want to go over five reasons why. Number one, <clears throat> that attempt to rewrite unfairly puts demands on battle-weary battle pro-life advocates. So people like Kirk Franklin who say you have to take care of kids from the womb to the tomb. And I understand the sentiment. I think Scott Klusendorf address that in the, the first part of this paragraph. Like, yeah, we definitely should care for people, but ultimately that's not the main objective of the pro-life movement. So when you say, well, if, you're, if you don't care about kids from, from the womb to the tomb, then um, you're a hypocrite. It's like people are really fighting to save kids from being unalived in, in just really disgusting ways. But okay, um, number two, it appeals to a false sense of moral equivalency. So it just doesn't follow through that it, you have to take care of a child for, for their entire life in order to care about them not being um, not being unalive before they even are born. Number three, it fails to distinguish Christian ethics from operational objectives. Fourth, it's not going to convert our components. They're not going to come to our side because we do all that they demand. And I thought that was an excellent point. 
if every single pro-life advocate today said, I'm going to sacrifice my life, my job, my earnings and do all that just so I can take care of every single kid that I save from from ending their life before they're born. Would these people stop being pro-choice and become pro-life? No, they wouldn't because that's not really what they want. They just want to give women the ability to end their pregnancies or in, uh, really, they want to give women the, the ability to take life, innocent life. Um, so yeah, I, I think what Kirk Franklin said as a Christian is just deplorable. I cannot support that. Um, I know people have different ideas on abortion. I, I just cannot, I cannot co-sign it. I just, you guys definitely do your research on, on what abortion is, what it isn't. Cause there's a lot of fear mongering, you know, like, yeah, that's, I might have to do a whole discussion on that for another um, live stream, but y'all check out Scott's, check out this gospel coalition um, transcript. I'm going to drop the link here in the live chat as well. So y'all can have that. Um, but yeah, so let us continue with the conversation. We're almost done. I can't believe we almost got through the whole thing. And I'm, I'm so glad that y'all even hanging out with me this late at night. Some of y'all must be on the West Coast because why are y'all still up? Okay. 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 I'm going to go back down here. Okay. That does not have the longevity of the heart of what would Jesus do? You are part of the problem and not part of the solution. And that's why I believe that deconstruction of all the majority of belief systems in America, we, that, that, that until we acknowledge the sins of our contributions, we're going to continue to see the demise of what Jesus would be within the framework of culture. Can I tell you one of my frustrating things that I witness on a regular basis is people speaking for Jesus. People speak, well, you know, this is, you know, God would do da da da, da and Jesus yeah, would do da, da. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. Unless you it's have a scary. It is. It's a scary. And it undermines their belief that he is a higher power. Especially when it's coming from patience. I, I, I think that what scares me even more than what you're saying is the arrogance yes. that we even communicate what we believe the Bible to say, meaning that 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 there's an there's this elitist spirit that we communicate that is very much, you're sick. You need help. You need Jesus. Mm. Let me tell you what you need. Do you know what I reply to those people with? What? May the force be with you. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, that's so scary. <laughs> you, you guys don't understand all the layers in that message right there. But Pro-Jesus, pro-life, period. That's right, Portia. That's right. Y'all, what is Kirk talking about? Man, I, it just, I, I really did just forget what he just said. So let me go back just a second because I know he said something crazy. You need Jesus. Mm. Let me tell you what you need. Do you know what I reply to those people with? What? May the force be with you. <laughs> But, but let me tell you, that's so scary. Y'all, you, you guys don't understand all the layers in that message right there. But yeah, see, because I know you, but well, now I know of you deeper. It's there's just layers, and that's scary the way you said that. Well, wow. but but I think that that it should be very much more of is that the posture should be instead of the communication coming from the doctor to the patient, it should be I'm in the same hospital room with you. I'm in the bed next to you, mm. and I'm saying to you, yeah, man, I know how that feels. Yeah, I can only imagine how that hurts you. Mm -hmm. I've gone through some things too. Yes. let me tell you about what this guy did for me. Speak on it. And, and 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 if he did it for me, I know there ain't nothing in your life that he would rock with you on. And so this 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 high. Do y'all know what that was just now? What he said. If he did it for me, so it, according to Kirk Franklin, the gospel is, and y'all tell me if I'm wrong in these comments. Did y'all hear what I just hear? The gospel is, God did something for me. And if I know if he did it for me, he will rock with you on anything in life. Is that what, let me, let me, I want to make sure I get his words right. Let's go back just a second again. To those people with, what? may the force be with you. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, that's so scary. <laughs> you, you guys don't understand all the layers in that message right there. But yeah, see, because I know you, some, but now I know of you deeper, mm -hmm. it's, there's just layers. And that's scary the way you said that. Well, <laughs> but, but, but I think that, that it should be very much more of, is that the posture should be, instead of the communication coming from the doctor to the patient, it should be. I'm in the same hospital room with you. I'm in the bed next to you. Mm. And I'm saying to you, yeah, man, I know how that feels. Yeah. I can only imagine how that hurts you. Mm -hmm. I've gone through some things too. Yes. Let me tell you about what this guy did for me. Speak on it. And, 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 and if he did it for me, I know there ain't nothing in your life that he would rock with you on. And so this, this, this hierarchy. I know there ain't nothing in life that he wouldn't rock with you on. That's the life. <laughs> that's the life I've heard. Well, there's plenty of things that um, God does not rock with, with us on because God is holy and righteous. And we are people who are we live in our flesh. And a lot of times we do the wrong thing. And God tells us what's right and what's wrong. And he gave us these 66 books now today known as the Bible to make it clear what is right and what is wrong. And this idea of Christians and sinners being exactly the same. We're the same as far as we're all human. We all sin, but the Bible makes the distinction between the, the righteous and the unrighteous. 
sinners and those who are saved, believers and non-believers, being born again and not being born again, wheats and tares, goats and, what is it, goats and lambs? I can't remember. Goats and sheep. Sheep have a shepherd, okay? As Christians, we have a shepherd. We are covered. Y'all remember when the Egyptians came out of uh, Egypt, the Egyptians, the Israelites came out of Egypt in the Exodus, God covered them, the pillar of fire, like these are the people of God. Now, by God's grace, through faith, we can all be born again. But if you're not born again, then, you, <laughs> then you're not born again. You don't have eternal life. And so it's our job as Christians to warn people, to warn people and tell the good news of the gospel, that Christ came, that he died, that he lived a sinless life for us, that he died on the cross for us, that he rose on the third day. That's the gospel, that we have to turn away from sin, that we cannot um, commit our lives to sin and think that God's just going to be like, yep, yeah, it's fine. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so I I am I am very concerned that Kirk Franklin would say that. Maybe that's not what he meant, but it just implied that God doesn't care what you do, how you live your life. You, he'll just accept you. Let me know what y'all heard. How did y'all interpret that? Uh, Oh, Kirk. Uncle Kirk. What you talking about, Uncle Kirk? The old type of posture that we have, have when it comes to sharing our faith, we are doing more damage. It is disturbing. It breaks my heart. And it is not for the longevity of the gospel that we all say that we believe in. Well, y'all believe in Kirk Franklin. This I know. <laughs> um, and let me just also say, like, you, you know, you, you are a testament. Uh, just your life is a testament of how faith is tested. Right. Mm -hmm. And it has not been a perfect life. No. But you have to keep coming back to. And I think, again, like I said in the beginning, I don't think faith is solely uh, related to just how it connects to Christianity. I think faith is the belief that there is something bigger. Uh, bigger is a loose term, but there is a, there was something broader. There is something uh, greater than you can even conceptualize mm -hmm. that is. That, that is guiding the path that you're on. And I don't know that any of us have the right answer. I genuinely don't. And I'm not saying that to like undermine you or you know the Muslim community, et cetera. I, I think we're all doing our best based on what we have been given. You have been given uh, centuries of academic study that you know convinces you that this is what it is. Uh, for me, it is more of a feeling uh, that I have. I mean, that may change if I did the same amount of academic study because I am somebody who is all about facts, baby. Uh -huh. Okay, I love me the facts. But I say all that to say that you know, in this conversation, um, I know that I'm speaking to somebody who, and I wanted to wait to be able to have this type of conversation with somebody who I know has been tested from many different sides uh, and has continued to exist as themselves within it, right? Like, okay, so what did y'all hear? What did y'all hear just now? That's that hollow philosophy that Colossians 2.8 was talking about. But I got another verse for y'all, okay? I got the verse. This is, uh, y'all got to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, because it speaks to this foolishness that she just spouted. Okay. <clears throat> My little path used to quote this one a lot. Okay. 2 Timothy 3. But I understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. That's what I'm hearing from Amanda. Her passions are leading her worldview. They are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So it's this, we can't know truth. You know, it's just whatever I feel in the moment. If I don't like it, then it can't be true. If I, if I do like it, then it's on the table. Right? Oh, okay. So let me, let me shop. Let me shop. Let me stop sharing my screen on that one. And let's all, we almost to the end of the video. I think there was one other thing that Kirk said that I was just like, come again, say what, sir? Um, where is it? Share screen. And there it is. Okay. All right. All right, Uncle Kirk. What else you got to say? That's kind of you. Thank you. Well, you know, I think that there's, 
I think there's a reality to just being human and that it has ebbs and flows and twists and turns. And we're all trying to get through. Some of us are trying our best. Mm -hmm. Some of us are not mm -hmm. trying our best. Mm -hmm. uh, but f having faith is a... Having faith is like Wi-Fi you can always connect to. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why you always got to pay the bill. <laughs> oh, my God. It can't... can't just be something you turn on when you need it. Yes, it can't be something you turn on when you need it. it you know, and, and I think that Wi-Fi doesn't work everywhere. So I would say that that that, that this belief system does. And, 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 and I hope that, that, that the damage that historically Christianity has done in the West, um, it's, and, and, I, and I do want people to know that Western, that Western Christianity and the teachings of Jesus Christ are not necessarily synonymous. That right there, that's like a part two. They're not synonymous. And you so, should do a whole masterclass mm -hmm. because that I don't think that, that statement is very, that's that's a strong statement. Yes, yes. And it's very true. And and so. Um, because it's those same people who are here in the West claiming, you know, Jesus to use, using the teachings of Jesus to try to undermine the people that facts. are his his facts. kin as well. Facts. From the Middle East. Facts, 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 facts. And so, and and again, the origin of Christianity was the Middle East. But I'm fine. <laughs> so we have uh, questions from folks. Remember, remember. Okay, that's pretty much the gist of it, but. I did find it interesting. She said, you know, faith is like Wi-Fi. You can just connect to it. I can't remember how she said it, but I, I did think his statement was interesting where he said, but uh, Wi-Fi doesn't work everywhere, but our the Christian faith does work everywhere. I did. I felt like that was a good clap back, come back. But then what he said immediately after was like another, you know, punch in the gut to the Western church, American church, like, all right, Christians in America, just want to say again, I don't like y'all. Y'all get on my nerves. Y'all put tell me I can't gyrate at my gospel concert. You're telling me that I'm wrong for this and I'm wrong for that. I'm sick of y'all. Like, Kurt, Kurt, what, where would Kurt Franklin be had it not been for Christians? Like, aren't we the ones who supported his whole career? I know that's not really the topic, but I don't know what, <laughs> why he is so mad. He seems to have a lot to say about Jesus and trying to prove that Jesus is is true and should be worshipped, but he doesn't seem to have a lot of love for the body of Christ. That's that's what I'm gathering, and I think he agreed with Amanda Seals a lot more than he should have on here. Um, yeah, Kirk Franklin. This this conversation was all over the place. He said some. He made some good points. He really did. But then he also said some disturbing things that I just I'm I'm concerned for Kurt. And I just feel like he pretty much misrepresented um, what Christianity is overall. And I think he's letting his opinions and his his own gripes with the church get in the way of of his witness for Christ. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to the last little article I wanted to read from. Is from y'all guessed it. Got questions because I always go to got questions, and it just talks about the mission of Jesus, why Jesus came in the first place, like what's the whole point of the gospel. <clears throat> All right, so they say this. Let me see. Can I get in the get in? Or maybe I should do that. I'm still small, but okay. Um, what was Jesus's mission? All right, they say several times in Jesus' life, he shows that he was a man on a mission. He had a purpose which he intentionally fulfilled, even at a young age. Jesus knew that he must be about his father's business. In the last days of his earthly life, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem where he knew he would be killed. It could be said that the fundamental mission, fundamental mission of Christ's time on earth was to fulfill God's plan of saving the law. Jesus put it this way in Luke 19.10, the son of man, came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus had just been criticized for going to the house of a sinner. Jesus responded by affirming his mission was to save people who needed saving. Their reputation for sinfulness was not a reason to avoid them. Rather, it was a reason to seek them out. So it's not wrong to, to see that if someone is living in a sinful lifestyle, it doesn't mean that you have to make them um, or purposely try to make them feel bad. There's all different types of reasons why people live the way that they do. Um, but that doesn't mean that their their sin isn't any less sinful. All of us have to acknowledge our sin. Um, that's that's just really you can't be a Christian if you deny your sin. Uh, OK, many times during Christ's ministry, he sought to forgive those whom the self-righteous leaders of the day shunned. He thought out 
saved a woman at the well, the Samaritans of her town. Um, the sinful woman with the alabaster jar, even one of his own disciples. In Matthew 9, once again, Jesus criti was criticized for eating with tax collectors and sinners. And once again, Jesus responded by stating his mission. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus' goal was to save. It was a goal that he reached. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. All through the Gospels, we see Jesus' call to repentance and forgive the worst of sinners. No one is too sinful to come to him. In fact, he goes after those who are lost, as the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin show. In the story of the prodigal son, Jesus teaches that God will always welcome with open arms those who come to him with a repentant heart. Even today, Jesus continues to seek and save those who humbly place their faith in him. So it's okay to talk like this whole conversation about sin and all that stuff that people want to avoid. Um, again, sin is not the gospel, but it is a, it's a part of the conversation. Like people should acknowledge like I've done something wrong. I need to be in right standing with God. I don't see what's so, so, what's so hard about that. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm wrong. And God's like, okay, good, good enough. I'll take it. You know, turn away from your sin. So Kirk, I, Kirk and Amanda, it's just her worldview. What she described was um, pantheism, really this idea that everything is God. I'm a God, you a God, she a God, we a God, like, when people say that kind of stuff, it doesn't make any sense because you're basically saying humans are no different than, than animals, than inanimate objects. It doesn't make sense. It's like there's no difference between my, my laptop and my life. So if I see a dead deer on the side of the road, that's no different than me seeing a, a person on the side of the road. Like There should be a difference. If we are not all the same. Humans are made in the image of God, but we are not God ourselves. But that's ultimately who the God of Amanda Seals is. She has become her own idol, and that's just not going to work out for her if she doesn't turn away from her sin. I, I like what y'all were saying in the live chat. Definitely pray for her. Um, she's clearly a smart woman. I did respect some of the statements that she said. She there was some truth in there, but she clearly hasn't. She hasn't done her homework on this. I hope that she does because you know eternity is a very important topic, and really pantheism just doesn't work out. I'm reading this book by Hugh Roth called the, the Creator and the Cosmos, and it just talks about how I'm going on a tangent tonight. But before I, before I let go, we're gonna talk about this Hugh Roth book. And I'm probably going to do another whole conversation or video on that, too. But it's impossible that there was not a creator. And the reason we know that there was a creator who can't be humans because humans fit inside of time. We have a creator who fits outside of time. OK, but we know that the universe is not the creator because the universe is not eternal. Did y'all know that scientists overall agree that the universe had a beginning? And why do we know that? It's because the universe is expanding. It's still expanding at a slower rate, but it is still expanding, right? So because the universe has a beginning, it must have a beginner. It must have a designer. It must have a cause. The cosmological argument says that anything that begins to exist must have a cause. And so what's the syllogism there? Well, the universe began to exist. And so if anything that begins to exist have, has a cause and universe must have been, well, I messed it up. The universe began to exist. So therefore the universe has a creator. I'm messing it up. Anyway, cosmological argument. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Um, I said all that to say atheism don't make no sense. Pantheism don't make no sense because then Amanda would also have to say the same, the same Republicans and, and, and other folks that she don't like. Um, they're God, according to her. We're all God, according to her, and magic and everything else. Uh, she's just making it up as she goes along. Anyway, thank you guys for hanging out with me. Um, please remember, again, I have set up channel memberships. So please, please, if you support what I'm doing and you want to see the channel grow, first of all, like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because what you guys do really help these videos get out and reach more and more people. But if you want to support me financially, please consider becoming um, a channel member. You can just hit the join button. I think it's right. If you go to my, my YouTube channel, um, just go to the, the main page and you should see the join button. And there's like different tiers, but I'm going to be putting out more content specifically for people who sign up to support the channel. So I love you guys. Thank y'all for rocking with me. 
let me know in the comments how y'all feel about um, this whole conversation, the things that you agree with Kirk on, the things that you didn't agree with Kirk on, because there's <laughs> so much to say. Um, but yeah, y'all have a blessed night. I will be editing out <laughs> all the mistakes from the, the early part of this live chat. So if anybody wants to rewatch this again, you, you shouldn't have to suffer through that. But mistakes happen. I'm human, right? Right? Okay. All right. Um, let me see. I want to make sure anybody is say anything. Y'all, y'all, y'all the bomb. Y'all the bomb. I, I got the best followers in the whole wide world. Okay. All right. Y'all be blessed. Happy Tuesday and good night. Mm -hmm.